Hello, hello, welcome, glad to have you here. Today what I want to do is to discuss a different practice involving the four elements. Now, I've done a number of videos on different practices with the four elements. Well, there's one practice, or at least a contemplation, that we find in one of these early Buddhist texts. It's a text called the Longer Simile of the Elephant's Footprint. And in that text, in that sutta, uh, Sariputta, who was the Buddha's sort of uh, right-hand disciple, the one who was the most accomplished in wisdom, gives a talk about the impermanence of these four elements and basically how we can use our, our understanding of that impermanence to uh, inform our own uh, uh, further understanding of, of non-self, basically. I mean, it's using impermanence as the contemplation, basically. The aim will be towards non-self. Uh, now, the discussion I'm going to have about this sutta is a little bit different from the other ones. Uh, it's problematic. The, 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 the discussion that Sariputta has about the impermanence of these elements is problematic in various respects. There's, 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 there's confusions that I have, at least, with his presentation, which it does not seem to me to be so clear in certain, in certain ways. And so I'm hoping that in this video I'll get across to you some of the the concerns that I have with his presentation. However, I want to emphasize that the main point that he's making is correct. It's absolutely correct, and we can understand it as correct on the most uh, current understanding of these topics. And so later on, I'll, I'll get to that whole point. Now, Sariputta's aim here is to uh, basically describe the way that each of these four elements is eventually going to disappear, is going to disintegrate. And as, you know, g going along those lines, the points that he's going to be making are quite a bit more, we might say, speculative, we might say cosmological, than was the case with the other practices we've already seen involving these elements. Okay, so that said, what does Sariputta have to say about the first one, the earth element? And I'll be going through each of these four elements, uh, one after the other, and we're going to see some sort of issues with each one of them. But anyway, the first, the first one is the earth element. Sariputta says, There comes a time when the exterior water element flares up. At that time, the exterior earth element vanishes. I should say exterior means outside of us, the... the the earth element that's in the exterior world. So for all its great age, the earth element will be revealed as impermanent, liable to end, vanish, and perish. Now Sariputta tells us this, he gives us this account during his sort of description of the non-self character of this earth element. And the idea being here that uh, what we're looking for in really all of early Buddhism when we're looking for a self is some idea of, of permanence, something that will be unchanging, that will be essential to who we are. And if we're looking for such a self in the earth element that surrounds us, we're not going to find it because, as Sariputta says, the earth element will eventually disappear. It's not permanent. So it doesn't fulfill the characteristics that we're looking for. However, the odd thing here is that what Sariputta says is that basically uh, the water element is going to rise up and sort of cover over the earth element. Now that, that to me strongly suggests he's talking about some kind of flood here. But we all know that in a flood, the earth element doesn't literally disappear in the sense of ceasing to exist. It's simply covered over by water. It still exists underneath all that water, though. Uh, so it's really not entirely clear what Sariputta means to be discussing here. And this is one of these issues. Uh, there seems to be a sort of an equivocation here between literally uh, uh, ceasing to exist, which is what he's trying to demonstrate, and simply being covered over, which is what he seems to show. So uh, now we can say perhaps uh, Sariputta meant to, to say something more like that the that the earth element is going to somehow dissolve in the water, you know, the way salt might dissolve in water. Uh, that's possible, although uh, he doesn't actually say that. And 
it's not really very convincing because we all know that a lot of earth element in the sense of the sand and rocks and so on don't dissolve in water. So again, this is a, this is a problem with the way he presents the thing. Second, Sariputta discusses the water element. And here he has a relatively lengthy sort of description. What he says is this. There comes a time when the water in the ocean sinks down a hundred leagues, or two, three, four, five, six, up to seven hundred leagues. There comes a time when the water in the, in the ocean stands just seven palm trees deep, or six, five, four, three, two, or even just one palm tree deep. There comes a time when the water in the ocean stands just seven fathoms deep, or six, five, four, three, two, or even just one fathom deep. There comes a time when the water in the ocean stands just half a fathom deep, or waist deep, or knee deep, or even just ankle deep. There comes a time when there isn't enough water in the ocean even to wet the tip of your finger. So for all its great age, the water element will be revealed as impermanent, liable to end, vanish, and perish. Now, the, a lot of the issue here uh, comes with these numbering, these, these uh, units, uh, leagues and fathoms, which I think most of us don't really uh, know very much about what they mean. A league, at least so far as I can tell, is about three miles. And a fathom is about the, the height of a, a human being, about six feet, something like that, a tall human. And uh, those are the terms that uh, Bhante Sujato, Bhikkhu Sujato, uses when translating this text. The actual terms are yojanas, the, that's the, the, the Pali term, and the height of a person. So we can understand why he uses fathom, it's roughly the height of a person. Yojana is about, uh, I, look in, I looked in a book of Bhikkhu Bodhi's to try to get an answer to this. Bhikkhu Bodhi says it's about seven to nine miles. So these are, are relatively large numbers that we're talking about here. Uh, in fact, the, as far as I can tell again, the deepest part of the ocean is the Mariana Trench, which is only 6.8 miles, or maybe, as far as I can see again, about one Yojana deep. So the numbers here, the, the, uh, the depths here that, uh, that Sariputta is talking about are not accurate. Uh, the, the, the oceans can't uh, go down that amount because they aren't that deep to begin with. Nevertheless, the idea in this passage here is that the water is going to cease to exist. Uh, presumably, we might say it's going to become water vapor or something like that. And that is indeed plausible. It certainly is the sort of thing that might happen. We can understand that, although it involves, of course, some cognitive speculation on our part. Uh, in, interestingly, in the Chinese version of this text, now there, are, there is a Chinese uh, recension, a Chinese version of this text, which differs in certain respects from the Pali. In one respect, it differs because in the Chinese version here, it talks about how the water element is going to be essentially uh, disintegrated by the earth, I'm sorry, by the fire element. And again, we can understand that in the same way that we can use fire to boil away water. And that's probably the idea here, is that the fire somehow, the, an excess of the fire element boils away the waters of the oceans. Again, this is plausible. This is certainly something we can understand. Now, we might wonder where Sariputta is getting some of his ideas. And there is a different discourse in uh, the Anguttara Nikaya where the Buddha talks about a mountain called Mount Sineru, or I believe it's Mount Sumeru in Sanskrit, which is said to be 84,000 yojanas high. And the Buddha talks about how in some future age there will be more suns in the sky than there are now, up to seven suns in the sky. Now, uh, uh, to be, again, to be clear, uh, the tallest mountain on earth is Mount Everest, which is not even one Yojana high, so there's nothing remotely like an 84,000 Yojana high mountain. Again, another issue with these kinds of speculative suttas. In any event, the Buddha talks about how, you know, there'll be one, there'll be one, there's one sun in the sky now, then there'll be two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and when we get to seven suns, then this, even this Mount uh, Sineru will 
uh, burst into, f into flames and disintegrate because of the heat. And that even before uh, Mount Sineru uh, disintegrates, it will, you know, the, the, these, the heat coming from these suns is going to boil out all of the waters of the oceans. Again, this is something that is plausible. It's something that we can understand. Indeed, something, it's something that scientists believe will happen when the sun itself, the single sun that we have, will, in the fullness of time, expand its size, grow in size, grow in, as a result, heat to the earth, and eventually the, the oceans will boil and uh, disintegrate. So the, the main point that's being made here is correct, although the, the fact that there won't be seven suns, that's, that's, a, that's a separate issue. Along these same lines, the, the third topic that uh, Sariputta takes up is the, the fire element. The fact that the fire element is impermanent and will, strangely speaking, cease to exist. Uh, what Sariputta says is this. He says, there, there comes a time when the exterior fire element flares up. It burns up villages, towns, cities, countries, and regions until it reaches a green field, a roadside, a cliff's edge, a body of water, or cleared parkland where it's extinguished for lack of fuel. There comes a time when they go looking for a fire, taking just chicken feathers and strips of sinew as kindling. So for all its great age, the fire element will be revealed as impermanent, liable to end, vanish, and perish. Now, once again, I think this is relatively confusing. There seems to be something of an equivocation here in what Sariputta is talking about. Uh, on the one hand, it's, it's obvious that fire is impermanent, and we all know that fire only exists so long as its fuel is around, and once the fuel has been burned up, the fire will go out. Uh, so it's not clear if what, uh, what Sariputta is talking about is that there's going to be uh, some kind of a lack of kindling or fuel for fire in the future, or if, on the other hand, he's saying that fire will somehow be impossible to create in the future. Uh, again, the, it's, not really, it's not really obvious what's going on here, and, and as a result, it's not really convincing the point that he's making, at least to me. Now, he says that the fire element will end, vanish, and perish, which seems to indicate that it simply won't be possible to create it at some point in the future. Uh, in another sutta, the Buddha describes how there, is, there are all elements and all things, basically, is the point that he's making, and so even within the trunk of a tree, there is the fire element. Now, it's pretty clear that there isn't flame inside of a tree, otherwise it would burn down, um, so my own understanding of these things, and indeed many people who practice, most practitioners I think nowadays, take this discussion of the fire element within the trunk of a tree or within our own bodies to mean that there is warmth or heat within these things. Um, and so in that way we can understand how there's, there's that, that element within things that would otherwise be burning. It's just, it's not meaning flames, it's meaning sort of warmth. But this pre presents us with a problem in this text, because if Sariputta is literally saying that the warmth in everything will cease and perish and die, then it's not like we're going to be wandering around with chicken feathers and sinew. We're going to be frozen solid, right? We're not going to have any warmth at all. We'll, we'll perish. We won't be there. Um, so again, the, the, the point that Sariputta is making here uh, the larger point is clear, that, that fire is impermanent, but the precise way that he's arguing for it, at least to me, is somewhat confusing. Fourth, and finally, the air element. This is what Sariputta has to say. He says, There comes a time when the exterior air element flares up. It sweeps away villages, towns, cities, countries, and regions. There comes a time in the last month of summer when they look for wind by using a palm leaf or fan and even the grasses in the drip fringe of a thatch roof don't stir. So for all its great age, the air element will be revealed as impermanent, liable to end, vanish, and perish. Now once again, there's something of what I would say is an equivocation here that uh, Sariputta is making between air, the air element on the one hand, and wind or moving air on the other. Once again, as with fire, it's uncontroversial, it's obvious that wind sometimes blows and sometimes doesn't. 
so that wind is something that is clearly impermanent. It's not something we can uh, necessarily count on at any time and place. But that's somewhat different from talking about the air element, uh, because even when the wind doesn't blow, there is air. After all, we can, uh, we can conjure up wind by blowing out with our uh, with our, uh, blowing out of our mouth, blowing uh, air out of our lungs, or by waving our hand, or as he says, sort of waving a fan. You can make wind. Even if there isn't wind at the time, you can manufacture it. So the fact that the wind uh, sometimes blows and sometimes doesn't blow doesn't show that the air element itself is impermanent, liable to end, vanish, and perish, as Sariputta claims. Uh, after all, if the air element is impermanent, then at that point when the air element dies, we won't be able to breathe. We will uh, expire due to suffocation. However, once again, the deep point that he's making is completely correct. That is to say that the air element around us, the oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen and other elements in the air, are themselves impermanent. They're liable to be lost to space, for example, uh, just in the same way that, that the water will be lost to space when the sun grows in many billions of years, so too the atmosphere will be lost to space. And indeed, all of the individual elements that go into making up the atmosphere themselves are impermanent and will disintegrate in the fullness of time. Nevertheless, all of these examples are intended to reinforce our sense of non-self in some respect by through showing us the impermanence of all the elements that go into making up our physical bodies. So by showing us that these elements are themselves impermanent and are subject to decay and eventual disappearance, we begin to understand that none of this is can none of this could be who we really are in some kind of permanent sense. Now, it's sometimes claimed that Buddhist practice is all about experience right here and right now. It's all experiential, basically. Uh, I hope to show, I hope to have shown in this video how the particular example of the practices, or at least the contemplations, that are presented in this sutta by Sariputta are anything but experiential right here, right now. They're all very cognitive. They're all very speculative, cosmological, involving thoughts and opinions and ideas about what's going to happen or what could happen in the very far future with the extinction of uh, the, the, the oceans, with the extinction of the mountains, with floods, with potential uh, a time in the future when it won't be possible to make a fire, all of these different things that are not the kinds of things that we can experience right here and right now. And indeed, this is a perfect example of what we might term visualization meditations, which took off in, in many later traditions, but indeed do seem to have a place as well in certain aspects of early practice too, as we've just seen. So, I did an earlier video about just this question of whether we're supposed to stop thinking within meditation. I'll leave a link to that video up here on the screen in case you haven't seen it. Thanks so much to all of my patrons over on Patreon. If you're getting something out of these videos of mine, consider uh, taking a look over at my Patreon page, which is linked below, and seeing if you want to help uh, join us and help support the channel. Thanks so much to you all, and we'll catch you on the next video. And meanwhile, all of you, be well.